Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today I'm in Druid Hill Park by the Conservatory but we're not going to talk about plants today. We're going to talk about clay tennis courts and civil rights. I'm thrilled that today I'm going to be joined by Tyler Wilson, uh, a senior at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC. Tyler spent the summer with us researching historic places and writing about them for our Explore Baltimore Heritage website and app. If you don't know about that, we'll put a link below. Um, including one of the places that he worked on uh, includes uh, the tennis courts uh, that are behind me. And if you can see the plaque behind me, that's what it's talking about. Before turning it over to Tyler, though, I thought I'd uh, share just two examples of where people have used sports to advance civil rights. There are loads of examples of that. Let me just uh, share two. The first, we're going to turn back to 1968 and the Olympics in Mexico City. Uh, the United States had two runners play uh, getting gold and bronze, um, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, uh, respectively, and uh, and then another gentleman from Australia named Peter Norman, who placed uh, silver. As the American uh, national anthem was playing and those three were on the podium, uh, the two Americans uh, lowered their heads and raised their fists, clad in black gloves. Um, all three were wearing a uh, pin that said, Olympic Project for Human Rights. And what they were doing was purposeful um, and it was planned and they were trying to point out inequalities, uh, racial inequalities around the world. Um, we know the image of the American athletes with their hands, uh, their fists raised. Um, uh, what we don't see as much is what else was going on. Um, neither of them were wearing shoes. They were wearing only black socks to represent black poverty in the United States. Um, one of them, I think it was uh, uh, Tommy Smith, had on a black scarf to represent black power. And Carlos, I believe, had unzipped his uh, running jacket a little bit to sympathize with blue collar workers around the world. He also wore a string of beads that, in his words, uh, was saying prayers for people who were murdered and lynched and thrown overboard during the Middle Passage, of course, that phase of the Atlantic uh, sailing uh, uh, slave journey. Um, the outcry against what they had done was, you know, was uh, swift and it was international, but there were many voices that also had uh, uh, spoke out in support of what they had done, and eventually all three were recognized uh, for their efforts. In the uh, words of the Australian government, um, they were recognized for their heroism and humility in advancing recognition of racial inequality. The American athletes were eventually awarded the Arthur Ashe uh, Courage Award. And that, of course, brings me to the second person I want to point out using sports to advance civil rights. We can't talk about tennis and civil rights without talking about Arthur Ashe. He was born in 1943 in Richmond and learned to play tennis on the blacks' only tennis courts um, near his house. He, of course, went on to be a tennis superstar, the first black player to win a national junior championship, the first black player to be part of the U.S. Uh, uh, Davis Cup team. Uh, he won three Grand Slam tournaments and many considered him the best tennis player of his day. Um, he advanced civil rights both as a player and in retirement. When he was denied a visa to South Africa to play in a tournament there, um, he mounted a, a lobbying campaign to get the U.S. to impose sanctions. He was arrested outside the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C., and later arrested again for protesting the ill treatment of Haitian immigrants um, again in Washington, D.C., we could talk a long time about Arthur Ashe, but I'm going to end with a quote from the Arthur Ashe Courage Award that the uh, broadcasters, the uh, sort of National Broadcasting Association, confers upon an athlete each year. And it's the person who, and this is their words, possessing strength in the face of adversity, courage in the face of peril, and willingness to stand up for their beliefs. That's to an athlete in honor of Arthur Ashe. I'm going to end by saying the first integrated tennis match Ashe played in was here in Baltimore in 1958, but that was 10 years after a number of local folks, including here in Druid Hill Park, had mounted years of efforts to try to integrate Baltimore's tennis scene. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler. Tyler, we're all yours. Hi, I'm Tyler Wilson. I'm a senior at UMBC, and I've been working this past summer as an intern for Baltimore Heritage, uh, in particular researching sites such as these clay tennis, uh, what well, were the clay tennis courts behind me. This was the site where on July 11th, 1948, an interracial tennis match took place that was or organized by the Young Progressives of Maryland as a protest against park segregation 
in Baltimore, but also as Maryland in Maryland as a whole. Now, at the time, uh, Baltimore City had a policy of segregating park amenities. This was not actually a mandated by law, but it was more of an informal policy that the city and park police enforced. And for this reason, the young progressives saw this as a perfect uh, target for a protest. They posted flyers uh, telling people about the match and what it's for, and they even sent a, a letter to the superintendent of the Maryland Bureau of Recreation telling him about the match. And they were very successful at drawing a crowd. Hundreds of people showed up in support of them, and also a number of park police also showed up to stop them if they tried to start a match. There were two courts that were uh, rented out or uh, reserved for the match. One would be reserved for four male tennis players. Two of them were white, two of them were black. And then four female tennis players, again, two white and two black. And the men were the first to attempt and start a match. Immediately, as soon as they went to serve, the police came up and told them to stop. When the men stood there and sat there on the courts, they were arrested. And the same thing happened when the women subsequently tried to start a match. In total, 22 people were arrested in relation to the protests on charges ranging, ranging from violating park rules, disturbing the peace, to conspiring to unlawfully assemble. And out of these 22 people, only seven actually served any kind of jail sentence. Those seven were only charged with disturbing the peace. The policy of segregating park amenities wasn't actually in law. So technically speaking, what they had done wasn't unlawful. It was just, it, it was just going about using park amenities. Not only was this precedent an important first step in Maryland civil rights, in the Maryland Civil Rights Movement, movement, but it was also important in the sense that it was the first time in Maryland history that both black people and white people together filed a lawsuit stating that Jim, Jim Crow laws violated their rights. As you can see, those clay tennis courts are no longer here. They were removed in 1989, and in 1992, uh, there was a plaque commemorating the protest uh, placed right here at the site. So uh, come on down to it. Uh, it's, it's a very nice place to come look at.